In this video, we'll primarily cover the holographic principle and error correcting codes as they relate to Donald Hoffman's Fitness Beats Truth Theorem. If you haven't yet, I recommend watching parts one and two to get the full background on Hoffman's FBT theorem, that the probability is zero that what we experience has any connection to veridical reality. He claims our moment-to-moment -moment existence is not homomorphic. It does not maintain any mapping that faithfully transports reality's base structure to our perceptions. Now, if we don't see true reality, then what are we experiencing? Hoffman thinks we experience life within a species-specific interface, akin to a computer screen. Folders and apps are merely symbols, hiding the diodes, transistors, and other electronics running the illusion. Space and time themselves are figments of our imagination. So does this worldview pass muster? While clearly on the edge, some would argue fringe, of science, there are actually a number of theories compatible with Hoffman's. He often references Seth Lloyd's Ontology of Qubits and Gates, You're very saucy. and holds in high esteem Nimar Kani Ahmed's Amplitihedron, along with the proclamation that space-time is doomed. Admittedly, we are leaving the better grounded Fitness Beats Truth Theorem to speculate on the true nature of our universal physics. Next, we'll cover holography and one of the strangest discoveries about the nature of space itself. But first, a few quick asides. One, all of the subsequent video clips and articles are linked below in the description if you wish to watch or read further. Two, whenever I've mentioned Hoffman's research, I usually mean him and his collaborators. It's just really clunky to always call them out, but he has a whole research team around him and I wanna make a note of that. And three, if you're enjoying this video, please subscribe to my channel. The holographic principle ranks highly for me as one of the most incredible, least known facts about the nature of our world. In my opinion, Hoffman himself explains the concept best. For example, here's one surprise. If I ask you how much information could you store in the volume of that volleyball? And say, so I can stick a terabyte hard drive in there, maybe two terabytes. And, but then there's the question, how, how, if you keep compacting those drives, you get to the ultimate, what's the ultimate amount of information you could store in that volume of space? And the physicists, in fact, Stephen Hawking answered the question. It doesn't depend on the volume. In fact, volumes don't hold information. It depends only on the surface area that bounds the volume. The amount of information that you can store in a volume is independent of the volume. And what that means, this is called the holographic principle in, in physics, and that means the following. Suppose you're a computer designer, you're gonna build a memory, and I say, well, uh, you can have this big sphere here and, and you can use that, or I'll let you have these six smaller spheres in, that just pack inside of it. Which would you use if you're trying to build the, the computer memory with the most memory? We might think, well, it's the big sphere, and you'd be wrong. The universe doesn't work that way. Space does not work the way you think. It all, it, you would actually do better. You get 3% more memory if you use the six smaller spheres. Now do that recursively. Take each of those six smaller spheres and pack it with six and do that 20 or 30 times. Now you've got a structure that has essentially no volume and millions of times more memory capacity. That's what space is like. That's really confounding if space is an objective 3D world that exists whether or not we perceive it. It's not confounding if space is simply a data structure with interesting properties that we have employed to get us information about fitness. So Gerard de Hooft, who was one of the first to propose, or to discover this, he won the Nobel Prize. To discover this, he said the fact that the total volume inside is irrelevant may be seen as a blessing since it implies that we don't have to worry about the metric inside. The inside metric could be so much curved that an entire universe could be squeezed inside our closed surface regardless of how small it is. Now we see that this possibility will not add to the number of allowed states at all. Then he says, we suspect that there simply are not more degrees of freedom to talk about than the ones we can draw on the surface. So the idea of space that we have in vision science is completely confounded by these kinds of results of the holographic principle in physics. Profoundly weird, right? Flying in the face of our intuitions, it is a fact that the information you can store is proportional to an object's surface area, not its volume. This is related to the curious case of black hole entropy, which says that the logarithm of the number of states of a black hole is proportional to the area of the horizon, not the volume in the interior. Now, how does this all relate to our moment-to-moment -moment existence within space-time? 
Quoting from an edge.org article written by Hoffman, in this case, the holographic principle points to a different conception of our perception of visual space. It is not a reconstruction of an objective and fundamental physical space. It is simply a communication channel for messages about fitness and should be understood in terms of concepts that are standard for any communication channel, concepts such as data compression and error correction. If our visual space is simply the format of an error correcting code for fitness, this would explain its holographic nature. Error correcting codes introduce redundancy to permit correction of errors. Here's an example Hoffman provides. This is a representation of a simple error correcting code known as a Hamming code. Let's say you're trying to send either a message 0 or 1 from New York to San Francisco. Across a communication channel, there is room for noise or errors in the message. A bit can unintentionally get flipped. So instead of just sending 0, you send three zeros. If the receiver of the message gets 000, they'll know you meant 0. If they receive 100, 010, or 001, they can assume there was an error in transmission and that the message is likely to be 0. You may ask, why not just send two digits instead of three? Well, with two digits, the combinations received are either 00, 01, 10, or 11. Receiving 10 or 01 provides no information about the intended message. Hence, the 3 bit code provides error correction while the 2 bit code does not. So, Hoffman tells us that in this case, we use a redundant three dimensional format to convey a lower dimensional signal. A threefold redundancy is the minimum for error correction utility for a binary code. The holographic redundancy in our perception of visual space might be a clue that this space, likewise, is simply an error correcting code for fitness. To hammer this home, I want to share another short clip from Hoffman. There's only one game in town, fitness. Anything else is irrelevant. So everything about the sensory system is a satisfying solution to the problem of getting us the information we need about fitness to stay alive and nothing else. So I think that space can be viewed perhaps as an error correcting code for information about fitness. So we think of space as a pre-existing stage, all of my colleagues do, as a pre-existing stage, stage in which the you know, drama of life plays out. I'm saying it's no such thing. It's a species specific data format. That's it. It's a data format that we use to represent information about fitness. It's like an error correcting code. Uh, there's redundancy in space. It's not a true objective reality independent of us. It's literally we're living in the data format that we use to have information about fitness. Now let's turn to physics. Theoretical physicist Jim Gates has discovered error correcting code in the string theory slash supersymmetry equations that ostensibly govern our universe. Specifically, doubly even self-dual linear binary error correcting block codes. Some physicists believe space and time might be a quantum error correcting code. From a Quanta article, that year, 2014, three young quantum gravity researchers came to an astonishing realization. They were working in physicists' theoretical playground of choice, a toy universe called anti-dissider space that works like a hologram. The bendy fabric of space-time in the interior of the universe is a projection that emerges from entangled quantum particles living on its outer boundary. Ahmed Mary, Shi Dong, and Daniel Harlow did calculations suggesting that this holographic emergence of space-time works just like a quantum error correcting code. They conjectured in the Journal of High Energy Physics that space-time itself is a code, in anti-dissider universes at least. The paper has triggered a wave of activity in the quantum gravity community, and new quantum error correcting codes have been discovered that capture more properties of space-time. We'll turn from the realm of physics to biology in a moment, but first, just where do the errors in our world come from? From an illuminating paper by information theorist Gerard Baital, we learn that the ultimate source of errors in the physical world is thermal noise due to the random motion of molecules which is very well modeled as a random process with Gaussian probability density. Now for bio. The paper we just referenced is primarily about error correcting processes in biology. By tall again. It turns out that heredity and biological evolution cannot be understood unless it is realized that genomes are endowed with such codes. 
genetic error correcting codes must exist. You could say humans are basically error correcting prediction engines. Though we take for granted that our sensory systems are slow, visual perception in particular lags behind by hundreds of milliseconds. As Brian Resnick at Vox reports, what we experience as consciousness is primarily the prediction, not the real-time feed. The actual sensory information just serves as error correction. Neuroscientist Adam Hanman says that if you're always using sensory information, errors would accumulate in ways that would lead to quite catastrophic effects on your motor control. Our brains like to predict as much as possible, then use our senses to course correct when the predictions go wrong. This is true not only for our perception of motion, but also for so much of our conscious experience. Modernizing Descartes, cognitive scientist Neil Seth declares, I predict myself, therefore I am. We perceive errors and make predictions. So error messages inform our mapping of reality, and the mapping informs our predictions. As the Maps of Meaning author puts it, error messages contain within them the implicit world. This is all well and good, but you're probably still wondering, how could it be possible that your moment-to-moment -moment existence doesn't reflect base reality? How can our conscious experience be altogether different from its building blocks? Which brings us to one of my favorite neuroscientist writers, Eric Howell, who is a proponent of causal emergence, a phenomenon where a macro model of a system, a map, can be more informative than a fully detailed model of a system, the territory. Embracing Claude Shannon's channel capacity concept, Howell finds that, quote, the theory of causal emergence can rigorously prove that macro scales are error correcting causal codes, and that many systems have a causal capacity that exceeds their micro scale representations. Causal emergence reveals a contrasting and counterintuitive phenomenon. Sometimes the map is better than the territory. Let's bring this all back to Hoffman and land this plane. Now you may argue that this is nothing more than the transcendental idealism founded by Immanuel Kant in the 18th century. But I think Hoffman's validations through math proofs and evolutionary game theory simulations elevate the argument to a higher plane. There actually is something new under the sun here. You might not think you're bounded by your fitness functions, but you're at the mercy of your perceptions which are at the mercy of your fitness functions. Consider all the complexity in our universe. It's too much to bear. So while the human brain processes roughly 11 million bits per second, the conscious mind can only process 50 bits per second. Your brain is constantly filtering out the vast majority of what it's computing, so the conscious mind can sustain this massively compressed information flow of about 50 bits per second. I find it beautiful we naturally surrender to the complexity and construct our own experiences. True enough is true enough. If you wish to learn more, I recommend Hoffman's book, The Case Against Reality, and his highly technical interview on Theories of Everything with Kurt J. Mungle. I will likely tackle Hoffman again, including his interface theory of perception and arguments for conscious realism. Stay tuned. We conclude with a meditation on the map-territory relationship. Hoffman would agree that, due to evolution by natural selection, the map is better than the territory. So I leave you with a quote from the late great Gregory Bateson. We say the map is different from the territory, but what is the territory? Operationally, somebody went out with a retina or a measuring stick and made representations which were then put on paper. What is on the paper map is a representation of what was in the retinal representation of the man who made the map. And as you push the question back, what you find is an infinite regress, an infinite series of maps. The territory never gets in at all. Always the process of representation will filter it out so that the mental world is only maps of maps, ad infinitum.